Welcome back. So for this lecture, we're going to continue talking about some of the sound changes um, on the changes from Indo-European into Germanic languages with a focus on the sound changes that took place. There were several major changes that took place regarding the sound system going from Indo-European into Germanic, and that will be the focus of today's lecture. Um, so in the topics we'll cover, we'll focus on the different phonological aspects, including some aspects of prosody, some basic vowel changes, but we'll devote bulk, most of the time to our consonant changes. This is where the bulk of the changes took place through the great consonant shift, as well as some other sound changes that took place in some Germanic languages as well. So when we think about the phonology of this, some of the most important changes going from Indo-European into Germanic languages happened within the sound system. And some of the main changes involve some of the prosody and syllable stress. There were some vowel changes. We had some consonant changes also that took place in a very specific order. So we'll talk through those changes in more detail and we'll go through the order that they took place. So to start with prosody, when we're talking about prosody, we're just talking about the sort of rhythmic alternation of syllables themselves. So it's not the sound itself, but more the way the sounds are being said. So whether we're strongly accenting, weakly accenting, if things are or aren't stressed, um, would involve prosody. And in Indo-European, stress was freely assigned. You could find it on any syllable of any word. So a particular word would have a stress on a a particular syllable, but you could find stress on any syllable depending on the word. And stress manifested differently during Indo-European than what we find in Germanic languages today. So during this time, it would have been known as what's known as a pitch accent system, where the stress is manifesting in pitch or intonation. So you're marking stress by having a slightly higher pitch on the syllable that is stressed in that word. And so you end up raising your pitch a little bit to mark that that's the stressed syllable. By the time we get to Germanic, though, this is replaced instead with a strong stress system, similar to what we do in English, where we are measuring the stress more in things like amplitude and loudness. So we tend to draw out the syllable a little bit longer, and it tends to be louder than the other syllables around it. So rather than raising pitch, we tend to raise volume and stretch it out um, a little bit longer. Stress placement also eventually became predictable in Germanic to where instead of being able to occur on any syllable of the word, it moved to always happening on the first syllable of the root word. And we'll see that in reference to some of the other changes um, when that part took place. But first, thinking about some of the changes to the vowels, there were some major vowel changes that have happened throughout English history. And these were some of the ones that affected Germanic languages differently than other Indo-European branches. So there's some changes that have taken place later on only affecting English. There's others that may have taken place throughout Indo-European that ended up affecting all Indo-European languages. But these are some that are unique to Germanic languages separate from other Indo-European languages. So firstly, the O form in Indo-European would have become an A ah sound instead, and we see this in examples of more recent uh, branches of language, where octo in Latin would have been atau in Gothic, which is no longer spoken, but was an East Germanic language. And then, somewhat ironically, in a reverse, a long A ah sound would have become an O sound um, in Germanic languages as well. So we see this in the word mother, where mater in Latin becomes motor in Old English. And so some of these changes are sort of maintaining some distinction in the vowel system where these changes are only affecting Germanic languages. And there were some other changes to the system as well. So in Indo-European, you would have had five main vowels that could be either long or short. So a, a, e, o, and u. And then there was a schwa that was only short. There was no long counterpart for that one. But there were sometimes diphthongs that you might find as well due to um, some of the changes that we see above as well as some other things that had happened during this time. A lot of those diphthongs are reduced into single vowels and left Germanic with only a couple of them. And we'll see some of the effects of that in Old English as well. Also something that changed with the vowels that was unique to Germanic is this process known as ablaut, where the change in a tense of a word is happening word internally, as opposed to adding a morpheme to the beginning or the end of a word. Um, so this is something we'll discuss in more detail with Old English as we look at more examples, but a present day uh, remnant of that would be sing versus sang, for instance, where the change in tense is happening in the middle of the word. We think of these as um, less common or sort of unique uh, examples, but this is an older form of um, how tense would have taken place in Germanic languages. But what we'll focus the most on is the consonant changes. So this time was marked by several major consonant changes, and this was known collectively as the Great Consonant Shift. 
So there's three major stages that take place with these consonants. The first one is what's known as Grimm's Law. The second one is known as Werner's Law. And then finally is when the stress shift takes place and everything moves to the first syllable stress. So the first two are involving a change in the actual consonants themselves, whereas the last is referring to that change in the stress placement and how the stress is manifesting. And this is happening in this particular chronological order as well. So it's important to remember the order of each of these stages um, as they're taking place. So if we think about what the consonants would have been like in Indo-European before these changes, Indo-European had three different manners of consonants. They had plosives, there was a single fricative S, and then there was sonorants. And so some of these may are nasal sounds, some of them are more like approximants, but there were just three sort of main distinctions in manner that were made in Indo-European. And all of the plosives are really what we're gonna focus on here, as well as some cases of that fricative, where the plosives underwent a complete transformation into Germanic languages that didn't affect other Indo-European languages. Um, it's estimated this likely happened around the first century BCE, um, and perhaps continuing for centuries after that. Um, but Jacob Grimm of fairy tale fame, and who also had discovered some of the similarities between ancient Sanskrit, ancient Greek, ancient Latin, um, also was responsible for documenting and discussing these particular changes in the Germanic stop system. And this happened way back in 1822. And so this is where the term Grimm's Law ends up coming from. So it's named after Jacob Grimm for having discovered this. So Grimm's Law is the first of these major consonant changes, and this affected all of the different stop and plosive series in the Indo-European language. So in Indo-European, you would have had voiceless plosives, p, t, k, and qu. You would have had voiced plosives, b, d, g, and gu. And then you would have had the voiced aspirates, which would have been b, d, g, g, where you have the voice sound, but you have that aspiration happening as well. Um, this is something that we no longer have in English and in other Germanic languages, typically. And the sound change is said to have occurred in five major stages, and we'll go through each of those stages in just a moment, but it's important to note, first of all, that the first stage actually has two different aspects to it. So there's a first stage that involves the voice aspirates, and then what those change to become a later stage of the development as well. So the changes affect some stages differently. And the ordering of this is also really important to keep in mind. So the five changes that are seen as taking place during Grimm's Law is that first, the voiced aspirates, the b sounds, become voiced fricatives instead. So b would have become a v. Um, this is not a sound we have in present day English, um, but if any of you are familiar with Spanish, this is um, what a b sound would turn into in between vowels. So a v sound. And then after that, the voiceless plosives became voiceless fricatives, so our p, t, k became things like f, th, and h, or h. And then after that, the voice plosives became voiceless plosives. So there were no longer any voiceless plosives. The voice plosives sort of stepped in and filled that spot that was missing. So b became p, for instance. And then the voiced fricatives that had become a result of stage one end up changing again. So stage one is also affecting what happens in stage four. So stage one takes us to those voiced fricatives. And then those voiced fricatives that became a result of stage one end up changing again and become voiced stops, voiced plosives. So the wa sound would become a b sound. And so this is replacing the voice plosives that had moved and had sort of disappeared and is sort of filling in that hole there as well. And then the last one is that the S sound is sometimes becoming a voiced sound when it's in voiced environments, when it's in between vowels or in between other voiced sounds. And so that one would have been the last stage to have taken place. So if we visualize what this would look like, the top row you'll notice has what the Proto-Indo-European forms would have been like. And then you have the numbers that sort of show you where the stages took place. So the first change of those voiced aspirates, the b sounds, for instance, move first to that midpoint where they become the voiced fricatives, so w, the, and ch. And then the next stage takes us to our voiceless plosives that move all the way down to where you see the bottom, the Germanic form of being f, f and either ch or h. And then you have the next stage where those voiced plosives are sort of filling in the gap that was left by the voiceless plosives and becoming voiceless themselves to where we get p, t, and k. 
And then if we go back to the left side, this is where stage four is taking place, where those fricatives are changing again and filling in the gap that forms from those voice plosives not being there. So then we have voice plosives back and we get b, d, and g. And then that last stage of s becoming z in between voiced sounds. And this is seen as an important ordering because there's a chain shift taking place. So this happens very commonly with sound changes where as one sound changes, it can lead to other related changes that create this sort of chain of events that takes place. And so typically this can happen when there's a gap in the system. This one is referred to as what's known as a drag shift or a pull shift because it's pulling things into a gap that's created in the system. So in Grimm's Law, we first end up with a gap in voiced aspirates, and then as the next stage takes place, we get a gap in voice pl voiceless plosives because we no longer have those either. So step three sort of fills in the gap of those voiceless plosives, um, but then leaves a gap of voice plosives instead. And so stage four is designed to fill in that gap of the voice plosives so that we end up with both voiceless and voice plosives that remain. And so you, the change in step two triggers the change in step three in order to fill that gap the change in three triggers step four to happen to fill in that gap. And then what we don't end up re left with and what sort of goes by the wayside is sounds that are less common and less expected to remain in a system. So when gaps are filled, you're typically gonna find a gap filled of a more common sound before you fill the gap of a more marked sound. Voice aspirates are a marked sound. They're not very common. We don't see them throughout lots of languages of the world. Whereas voice and voices plosives without that aspiration are extremely common and are some of the most common sounds in languages of the world, some of the most rudimentary sounds that we find in most languages. So it makes sense that those would be the ones that we fill in the gaps for so that we maintain um, the presence of voiceless and voice plosives. And then we can get rid of the voiced aspirates. We can get rid of the voiced fricatives because they're not as common of sounds across languages. So to give some examples of where we see other Indo-European languages not going through this change versus the Germanic languages that do go through this change, you notice that in Latin, examples like pedis or pater um, are instead an F sound in English, so we get foot or father. Or in the Latin words tres or tonare, we get three and thunder, so we're getting the fricative sound there instead. Um, in the case of the velar one, sometimes you ended up with a h sound, sometimes you ended up with a h, an h sound. These examples that remain today are all h sounds, so canis becoming hound, cornu becoming horn. <clears throat> and then we see this with the voice plosives becoming voiceless as well. So this is something that in, for instance, the old Bulgarian word for slabu becomes sheep, so the b becomes a p. Um, words in Latin like dentis or duo becomes tooth or two. And then granum, agar becomes corn, acre. And so we're seeing those voiced ones becoming voiceless. But Grimm's Law, even though it explains a lot of the changes that took place in Germanic languages, didn't account for all of the data that was present. There were some exceptions that were pretty notable. And someone else came along later in the 1870s, Carl Werner, who was looking at these examples that didn't really fit the pattern and put forth what came to be known as Werner's Law to account for these exceptions. So the exceptions that he found and that he needed to find an explanation for were that there were sometimes voiceless fricatives expected to appear, so f or th or ch, and instead um, were showing up as voiced fricatives. So you're getting a v or a the or a r instead. And so this would be based on the changes that took place in Grimm's Law in stage two, when those voiceless plosives became voiceless fricatives. You were instead finding a few cases where they're actually voiced instead. And then also he was noticing that in some cases where S would be expected to switch to Z between voice sounds, you're instead finding an R. So this is affecting stage five of Grimm's Law. So Werner's Law was aiming to explain why these changes, why these exceptions that were found actually occurred. So this is applying to the results of Grimm's Law. So the ordering of these ends up being extremely important, where all the voiceless fricatives became voice fricatives in these specific environments. And so this is the exceptions, the environments that Werner identified, that it had to be preceded by an unaccented syllable. So the syllable in front of it was not an accented one or not a stressed syllable and it had to be surrounded by voiced sounds. 
So Werner's law gives us a good use of looking at the time frame for when these things happened, because Werner's law could only have taken place after Grimm's law and before the stress shift in Germanic languages. So because Werner's law resulted from a free stress, you have to have this happening before the stress moves to the first syllable, because if the stress was always on the first syllable, we would never have an environment where we would expect this to take place. So if the stress was at the first syllable, it would always be preceded by a stress syllable, and this wouldn't give us the environment. So this is happening in environments where the stress is not at the beginning of a word. Also, because it has to be based on some of the results of certain stages of Grimm's Law, it had to have occurred after those changes had already begun. So it has, has to have occurred at least after stage two, because you're seeing some of these changes um, at, that you would expect in stage two, instead changing into this other sound based on these environments. So to look at a few examples of what words are sort of left over that Werner's Law accounted for, where you have the original sounds of p, t, k, or s. So the voiceless plosives in the first three being stage two, the s being stage five. So in a Greek word like hepta, meaning seven, in Gothic you get sehun. So you're getting not a f sound like you might expect, but instead a voiced fricative. And then in a word like Latin pater, for father, you get father in Gothic. And so you're getting the voiced sound instead of the voiceless sound that you might expect. In something like the Greek word hekura, you get Old English swear. So the r sound is happening there where you would expect a h or a h sound instead. And then an example from Sanskrit, snusa, for daughter-in-law becomes the Old English word snoru. And so you would expect a z. It's in between two voiced sounds, but you're instead finding an r there in, um, rather than a z. So, and you can see the accent mark afterwards in those examples where you might expect something different, but because the accent is happening afterwards, you're getting instead that other change. So the chronological order becomes really important, where first Grimm's Law takes place with that chain shift of all of the different plosive sets. Werner's Law sort of fills in the changes that are based on the stress patterns and the, the free stress nature of these different words. And then finally, the stress would shift into the first syllable after Werner's Law took place, because without the stress um, having changed, it allows for that environment to exist. So together, these three steps are known as the first consonant shift or the great consonant shift. And it's referring to the effects of both of these laws together and then the stress shift that took place. So that's the major change that happened with all Germanic languages and the, what we'll end up focusing most of our practice on in our synchronous classes. But to recap some of the general major changes from Indo-European to Germanic in terms of the linguistic changes, there were six major things that distinguished Germanic languages from these other Indo-European languages. So first, we had the large common vocabulary among Germanic languages that's not shared by other Indo-European language branches. Germanic retained that strong versus weak adjective distinction, something that other branches did not retain. We developed what are known as weak verbs that have our past tense dental preterite, so our ed ending, for instance, in present day English. The two tense verbal system, so sort of conflating tense and aspect into just present and past, and then using phrasal structures to convey information otherwise. Grimm's and Werner's law, which we just talked about, that major first consonant shift. And then finally, that fixed stress accent moving to the first syllable of those root words. So these are the things that affected all Germanic languages moving from Indo-European to Germanic. But there were also a few other changes that affected some Germanic languages, but not all. So the first consonant shift would have affected all Germanic languages relatively equally, whereas some other sound changes did not. So the second consonant shift, which by nature of its name, happened after the first one, was found to affect some aspects of modern High German, but not Low German and English, which came from that branch. And this didn't change equally in all forms of High German, and we'll talk about some of the reasons for that in a second. So what the second consonant shift looked like is that the voiceless plosives after Grimm's and Werner's law would have taken place, changed again in some high German varieties while not changing in the low German varieties. And so this is where we get some changes that you notice between English and German, for instance. So when you have P, T, or K typically at the beginning of a word, 
Old High German would have had instead an affricate that forms. So p becomes p, t becomes ts, and k becomes k. And so things like the word pipe in English becomes pfeife. And so you get the p at the beginning, but you notice that that f is um, changing separately in the middle of the word based on the fact that it's not at the beginning of the word. Because in the middle of a word, p, t, and k just became the, voiced fric the voiceless fricatives. So in pipe, you get pfeife, and so that second p is just becoming an f. Same as hope becoming hoffen, or you get water becoming watzer, um, cake becoming kuchen, kuchen. Um, so you're getting some of the changes where you're getting what would have resulted in those voice, voiceless, fric uh, voiceless plosives at the end of the Grimm's Law and Werner's Law changes are again changing, but only in some of these high German varieties. And it's important to notice that when this was found, it's found primarily in more southern German-speaking areas. This is why it's affecting Swiss German, it's affecting Bavarian German. And the isoglosses are, seem to change further west. So this suggests that the shift is taking place starting in the southern reaches of German speakers, and probably among those that had more social or cultural prestige of language use to influence other speakers to do this. So it would have spread from southern-speaking regions into more northern speaking regions, and but not affect everyone quite as equally. <clears throat> and some of the possible reasons that linguists have posited for why this change may have taken place include that some of the original Celtic tribes that were interacting um, with these speakers would have tried to speak German with their own sound patterns that could have affected the change and affected them um, how they're pronouncing some of those sounds or that possibly there was influence from Armenian as a substrate language, a less prestigious variety that was being spoken in the same area during this time that would have caused a slight shift to take place. So in a long-term language contact situation, you might expect some changes and some influences to affect the other languages as a result. <clears throat> so those are the major <clears throat> phonological pieces that we'll cover for going from Indo-European into Germanic, <clears throat> excuse me, but before we go, I do want to give you an illustration of what it would have sounded like. And so I have just a short, like 50 second or so um, story for you in both Proto-Indo-European and in Proto-Germanic. It's the same story. So you can listen to both of them <clears throat> in turn and notice how different they sound from each other and how the Proto-Germanic might even already start to have a little bit more uh, familiarity to you. So we'll start with the Proto-Indo-European one. This is what it would have sounded like around 4500 BCE. So that gives you an idea of the Proto-Indo-European sounds, and then if we switch to the Proto-Germanic language, Awis echoes ur, Awis huisewullo ne est echoan spichi, ein kuru wagu wegandu, ein uch meko bura, ein uch gumenu ahu berandu, Awis nu echo mazwuhi, hert agnatai mek echoans akandu gumenu witandi. Ech was wilha, Huludi awi, Hert agnotayun sweetun dumaz, Rumo, Fadis, Wulu awya, Sibi warma westra hornu di, Awya uch, Wullo neisti, Sat hachluaz, Awis akra buki. The Proto Germanic sounds, this is coming from around 750 BCE or so you'll notice some of the changes that took place and listen for if anything um, with the translation might even sound somewhat familiar. <laughs> 
go. I just want to give you a little step-by-step -step visual. You'll have a handout available on Blackboard that illustrates this as well, of Grimm's Law and Werner's Law, where Grimm's Law, you have your first step of the voiced aspirates becoming voiced fricatives, and then the second step where the voiceless plosives are becoming voiceless fricatives. This leads to a hole in the system that step three then fills in, so it sort of fills in the gap and takes those voice plosives and becomes voiceless plosives. Step four then also fills in a gap where those voiced fricatives from step one end up becoming voice plosives instead. And then we have that last step where S is sometimes becoming a Z sound. And then we have Werner's Law where in step two and step five some changes are happening. And this is only happening when both of these cases are true, that it's both between voiced sounds and that it's, it's coming before the stressed syllable and not after it. So the lowercase sigma that you see there is what we use to signify a syllable in our linguistic notation. So you'll notice that the accent mark is on the syllable after the environment that it's changing. And so this has to have happened before that major stress shift. So as always, if you have questions, email me, schedule office hours, and bring questions to class. We'll be reviewing this and talking about especially Grimm's and Werner's Law in our synchronous class. So some of those stages, if they still seem unclear, if you have any lingering questions, bring those to class so we can discuss them together and go over some practice with them. So you may have noticed that there's a lot of difference from the first to the second one, but that some of the words already start sounding similar to what we even have in modern day English. So words like heart or wool may have sounded somewhat similar. So it's showing that some of the changes that took place there, we still have some things that are already starting to sound somewhat familiar. And that gives evidence of how old some of those words are in Germanic languages and in English itself. So before- The Proto-Indo-European language. Wowis ekiwasque. Wawe, yes me hult nag ne est ekiwams de dorkie. Tom gurhum, wokyom, wekhontum. Tom mikiyum, parom. Tom tikemunum, wokyu, berentum. Wowis ekwe pioswe uked. Kier ag notormoi, dikemunum, ekiwam saguntum, widen tei. Ekiwaswe ukond. Kyuluti roe kier ag nutorns me win pios. Tikiemo otis oyum rutnag se poi quermum western purnauti. Royum que rutnag ne esti. Tod kekliwos roes ragrium puged.